Good evening. Good evening once again. God is good and all the time God is good and that's his nature. We want to take this opportunity this evening um, to welcome you to this midweek prayer um, evening that we are here. Um, all of you who are joining us online, may you feel at uh, Jesus' feet and may we uh, be blessed this evening as we hear from him. Also the ones in the sanctuary, may you feel blessed. May God bless you even as we continue in this worship. Um, we want to um, thank everyone who made it to this place and even the ones joining. May we continue to be together in, and worship God in truth and in spirit. This evening you're going to listen to God's word titled Good Intentions, Poor Connections from our brother Sullivan Kiprotich. Let's keep him in prayer uh, even as he will is preparing to come and break the bread of life. May you all be blessed even as we continue in this service. Thank you. Good evening. Our scripture reading is taken from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 22, verse 44. But I will begin from verse 43. And it says, In everything he followed the ways of his father Asa and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. And the people continued to offer sacrifices and burnt incense there. 44. Jehoshaphat was also at peace with the king of Israel. May the Lord bless the reading. Good evening. I want to take this opportunity to invite all of us to this midweek of prayer. We are grateful that God has led us uh, this far until we are in the middle of the week. And there are many things that we can give uh, thanks unto him so far. Before we start this evening's uh, sharing from the word of God, I'd like to invite us to bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, what in heaven, we humble ourselves before your presence this evening. Thank you, Father, for the gift of life and for giving us an opportunity to come before your presence. Forgive us, Lord, where we have fallen short. Remove anything that may stand in between our worship and you. I ask, O oh Lord, that this evening as I share from your word, may you give me understanding that I may be able to discern your word, O oh God. May I decrease as you increase. Above all, O oh God, may you be seen as I present the truth from your word. God, I pray that in all things let your will be done, for it is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I'd like to welcome all of you, those who are joining us online uh, this evening to this uh, midweek of prayer. As we delve into the topic of the day, good intentions and poor connections. Um, to start us off, I'd like just to paint a picture of, uh, or really just put some context into uh, this, this topic for this evening. So in our, in our everyday lives, uh, when you go about our daily activities from one place to the other, um, we are always chasing after something. Most people are always chasing after something. It could be deadlines for work they want to beat. It could be fitness goals that yeah, one wants to attain. It could be academic pursuits that one wishes to accomplish. Um, it could be a country home that even one aspires to build, among many other plans and aspirations. All these activities, we know that they are informed by certain objectives. 
uh, that we desire for our lives and for the lives of those who are dear to us and those who depend upon us. Now, as we go about strategizing and putting in place measures uh, that will make it possible for us to attain the desired outcomes of the plans or the projects or the ventures that we uh, eng are engaged in or intend to engage in, there are certain basic considerations that we should not, or rather they should not be overlooked in all these things. Some of these considerations involve uh, or include the scope of whatever projects we want to put in place, the resources that are required, um, the duration of time that we intend to have the project completed, among many other things. And uh, all these considerations can, uh, are summed up very well in the book, Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 30, which says, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down fast and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. So essentially for anything that we intend to do in, in this life, any projects or any aspirations that we intend to accomplish, we are admonished and uh, we are counseled by the word of God that we ought to sit down and count the cost to make sure that we have enough to accomplish it. Now with this background, I'd like us to focus on an aspect of planning which is highlighted in verse 28 of Luke chapter 14. And that is a concept of counting the cost. This concept is normally informed by the scope really of whatever it is that we intend to accomplish. And uh, at this point in time, I'd like to, uh, one may decide then to seek for you know, additional resources in the form of maybe partnerships or alliances with one who's like-minded and one who shares in the vision of whatever it is that they want to accomplish. And uh, we have seen a number of such endeavors happening all around us each and every day we see these things happening, especially in the corporate world. You will see organizations merging in order to, um, you know, uh, attain more, probably build more in terms of their customer base, be more competitive. Uh, we see a lot of uh, partnerships, especially even in, in the political world, people who have a political ambitions coming together, forming alliances uh, for knowledge sharing purposes. You see institutions partnering with uh, other institutions in order to exchange ideas on how to go about certain things. Another aspect of why we see these things happening is whenever there is some level of exposure and organizations want to minimize the kind of risks that they'll be exposed to, then they end up getting into agreements with other like-minded institutions. It could be for trade, it could be also for uh, purposes of security and many other. Um, aspects of partnerships that we see people people get into. I think a very good example that can resonate with most of us is whenever we have uh, we have these micro I, I'll call them micro finance institutions or in other words charmers people coming together putting their resources together in order to uh, to to fulfill a certain object object objective. And as much as most of these partnerships may or majority of them may possess some level of success. That is not always the case. Uh, this is because there are certain conditions that need to be well considered whenever we are getting into such alliances. One of them is common goals. We should be able to share common goals in, the, uh, in, in whatever you want to accomplish. You should have shared values amongst uh, each other, the partners, Another aspect is trust. Trust is very key. You are able to, you, you have comfort that your other partner is not, will not, you know, uh, stab you in the back as you get into this adventure that you're getting into. Communication is very important. Sharing of information amongst each other. Then, of course, clear roles and responsibilities. Each party has to know what their obligations are. 
Those are just some examples. There are many others that we could look into. And uh, so just to give an example of, of, of certain partnerships or sometimes why things may not go as we intend to do, I draw an example from the world of sports and in particular the world of motorsports. So in, uh, in 2013, uh, this motorsport team called McLaren got into, a got into a partnership with a manufacturer called Honda. So the, 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 the aim of that partnership was for Honda to, pr to supply them with engines, and then McLaren will take care of all other logistics that involve racing. But as history goes, this ended up being a very... Uh, it ended being a very, not a very good partnership because at the end of that uh, period or the partnership, McLaren, which had an ambition to, of course, win championships with their vehicles, ended up not achieving that objective. Why? Because the engines that were supplied by Honda had reliability issues. So there are many, of course, there are many, there are many aspects around that story. But yes, that's just to paint a picture of whenever we get into partnerships without really uh, clear objectives and clear goals, we can end up on, on the losing side. Now, where in the Bible do we see such an alliance that was formed that eventually didn't end up well? I'd like us to turn to the book of First Kings, chapter 22, verse 44. The Bible says, and Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. In other words, he formed unity with the king of Israel. If you read in uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 18, King Jehoshaphat formed an alliance with the king of Israel. Who was the king of Israel at this point in time? This was none other than King Ahab. Now, to delve in a bit deeper, looking at King Ahab, I want us to focus on him a bit. King Ahab had a project. This project was to reclaim the land of Ramoth Gilead, which was in the hands of the Assyrians and which he believed was part of the land of Israel that was promised to, by God to the children of Israel. So upon doing his assessment, he came to a conclusion that he needed to bolster his armies. Uh, he needed to reinforce his forces to ensure that he could increase the chances of victory against a very formidable uh, Assyrian army. And as a result, he therefore sought the help to the help of his daughter's father-in-law, who was none other than King Jehoshaphat which he willingly accepted. We see this in 1 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 3. The Bible says, And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. So the question that we ask ourselves is, why then is this? Was this a poor connection? To answer this question, let us look into the characters of these two kings, starting with King Ahab. We read in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 30, and the Bible says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, above all that were before him. So in essence, whenever the Bible, whenever you read the history of the kings in, in the Bible, especially in the book of Chronicles. Whenever the story of a king begins with these words, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, essentially it's like a summary of their reign or their term in power. And uh, King Ahab's history is one that may be common to most of us or not, but we know that he had... He did evil in the, in the sense that all his actions were against that which God desired 
of him, especially as a ruler, as a king. He was not only a king who did administrative duties. He was also their spiritual leader. He was supposed to lead the people in, in a way that will glorify God. That is why we see uh, in the history of these kings, most of them, whenever they come into power, especially if it's a godly king, they will ensure that they have brought down all the altars of, of idols or, you know, set up in groves around the nation and destroy all of them, you know, burn all idols and establish a proper system of worship. That was the kind of responsibility that was placed at, uh, upon these kings. Now, if we read in the book of First, or the same book of First Kings, chapter 22, verse 43, we get to see an idea of the kind of king who King Jehoshaphat was. It says, and Jehoshaphat, sorry, it says, uh, verse 43, and he walked in all the ways of Asa his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. I'll pause there. That is also another summary of the kind of king who Jehoshaphat was. Now, back to our story of this alliance that was formed. When King Ahab reached out to King Jehoshaphat about this project, King Jehoshaphat did his own assessment of the same, and he, and he pleaded with, king, uh, with the king of Israel, that is king, king Ahab, and he asked him a question. So First Chronicles, we go to First Chronicles chapter 18, verse 4. What does the Bible say? First Chronicles chapter 18, verse 4. The Bible says, um, sorry, not First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, apologies for that. I believe even the previous reference was Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 3. The Bible says, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, of the word of the Lord today. So Jehoshaphat, in his own assessment, he needed more information about this project. He needed the assurance that if indeed he was getting into this venture, there was success guaranteed. And that's why he, he implored again, uh, upon the king of Israel to seek the counsel of the Lord. Therefore, King Ahab, in his wisdom, called prophets um, to inquire or to seek to know more about this venture. And we are told in verse 5, Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets 400 men and said unto them, so let's mark that number very and note it somewhere. He assembled a team of 400 men. That number is quite significant. We remember even in the, in the, in the showdown at Mount Carmel, the number was around that, around 400 thereabout. So he had this huge contingency of prophets whom he would inquire of whether this project was going to work. And we are told that when he asked whether he should go up for this battle, all of them responded and said, go ye forth, you shall prosper. But King Jehoshaphat was not convinced, and he implored further and said, isn't there any prophet of the Lord? That is in itself a very pertinent question or a red flag, if I may term it, in this nature of partnerships. Because we see the kind of information that King Ahab was relying upon was not accurate. So that's also a very key um, item that we need to be cognizant about. The information that we receive whenever we get into any engagements. How trustworthy is that information? This King Jehoshaphat knew very well. That is why he pressured him more. And that's why King Ahab said, yes, there is but one, but this person never prophesies in my favor, just to paraphrase it. Then he sent forth 
for King for Prophet Micaiah to be to be brought forward. And the man whom he sent to bring Prophet Micaiah gave instructions to Micaiah telling him, please say that which the king wants to hear. But Micaiah told him, I will only speak that which the Lord commands me. And we see that's exactly what he said when he was brought before these kings. They were seated there and uh, he spoke to them and he told them, if you go to this battle, this is going to be the outcome. So, at this point in time, we see the information has been conveyed to each of the kings. They have an opportunity to assess and see whether they should still proceed with this venture. Now, when you read a bit further, given the kind of character that King Jehoshaphat had, we, as much as it was um, his intention, he was a God-fearing man. He, were, he did everything that honored and pleased the Lord. But because of his choice, his intentions might have been good. Um, he ended up making a decision that ended up costing him. And this we will see when we come to the conclusion of our sharing this evening. To, to, to cut it short, I'll not go into the details. We, all, we can go and read further in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 18, uh, onwards and see what really transpired when they now went ahead to implement this project that they, the king had conceived. Um, in the process of, of executing, they thought, or King Ahab, in his own wisdom, if we may call it, thought that he could come up with a way, he could devise a method in which he can circumvent that which had been prophesied. Because he knew that if he was to go uh, into this battle in his robes as a king, he would definitely attract the attention of the Assyrians. And that is where he thought he, he could deceive them by telling King Jehoshaphat to come, you know, dressed as a king in his kingly robes, and he is going to disguise in himself. Uh, as, 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 as an ordinary soldier. Again, the aspect of trust, which, which uh, we mentioned earlier when we were doing the, the introduction to today's message, there was clearly a breakdown, first of all, in the trust because we see King Jehoshaphat, probably he did not see the rationale. Why do you want me to go into this battle dressed as a king and you not as a king? And we see clearly what that resulted too, because in the battle, the king of Assyria commanded his armies and told them, do not fight against anyone else, but just target the king of Israel. And that is exactly what they did. They went after the person who looked like a king. But as we all know, uh, God's word indeed is true and stands the test of time. The, the prophecy that was given by the prophet Micaiah came to pass, and King Ahab was killed in that battle. Hezekiah, King Je Jeho Jehoiakim, uh, apologies, yeah, King Jehoshaphat, on the other hand, was able to survive that battle because in the heat of the moment when he realized that he was being pursued, he cried out unto the Lord. He cried out unto the Lord, and the Lord heard his cry. That we read in 2 Chronicles 18, verse 31. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, and they said, It is the, it is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. So in the midst of the battle, Jehoshaphat realized the mistake that he had done. He had joined 
as much as his intention might have been good, the kind of connection he had made with this king was a connection in futility. But upon realizing that, he turned to the true source of power, and that was the Lord God Almighty, who delivered him out of his uh, despair. Of course, this was not without consequences. Because as we see in, uh, in the same book, of, if we go to 1 Kings chapter 22, 1 Kings chapter 22, we are reading from verse, we are reading verse 43, where we left off. And he walked in the ways of Asa his father, he turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered the burnt incense yet in the high places. So he still had a lot of work to do. And when we compare that to now Second Chronicles chapter 18 from verse 1, which talks about Jehoshaphat, he had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. Talking about the affinity that he joined. Further on, we see he continues with these same uh, choices. Later on, we come to learn of his um, alliance with the with, with another king, that is King Hezekiah, to build ships to, go, to sail to Tarshish. But he did this against the word or the counsel of God. He proceeded on, and we see um, that leading to loss. It was actually King Ahaziah, not Hezekiah, sorry. So now, with all this in mind, what lessons are we picking from the kind, from this story of, or this alliance between Jeho Jehoshaphat and King Ahab? I want us to learn four lessons. Lesson number one is never underestimate, underestimate the power of ungodly influence. Never underestimate the power of ungodly influences. For, most, for the most part, as we have learned in, the his, in Scripture, King Jehoshaphat was a God-fearing king. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but nonetheless, he still allowed himself to make choices that were ungodly. These ungodly choices had an ungodly influence upon his life. These decisions, of course, did not please God. And therefore, in the attempt, and then, so how does this then uh, apply to our lives this day? In our pursuits of life, in our pursuits of uh, the things that we go after in this life, we may end up making decisions or making choices or getting influenced by people who are not in the right standing of God. I think most of the time we may have good intentions. Of course, we are encouraged in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, where we are given the commission to go ye out there and preach the gospel of the good news to all tongues, all kindred. But as much as our intentions may be good, we need to be careful that we are not influenced in the wrong way. Sometimes we may say, of course, but did Jesus mingle with sinners? He was Jesus. Yes, he was Jesus, but we are not Jesus. Our circumstances are different. We are weak, we are sinners, and as we read in Jeremiah, that the heart is wicked, exceedingly wicked, Above all things, who can know it? We are not to trust in our own understanding as we 
read in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, but we should always rely upon God himself. Therefore, we should always, we should strive not to underestimate the power of ungodly influence. Number two, majority are not always right. In, in, a, in trying to establish the viability of this project, King Jehoshaphat implored upon King Ahab to inquire of the Lord. King Ahab summoned 400 prophets against one prophet of the Lord, whose prophecy was actually the one that ended up being correct. Therefore, despite a majority of the prophets saying that the project would be a success, the word of God came to the kings through the prophet Micaiah, which came to the kings, was actually fulfilled. It is not a sin to listen to the opinions of others, but we should take time to reflect upon the circumstances that we are in, commit it to God in prayer, and make an independent decision. Acts chapter 17, verse 11 says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Paul further tells the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in, in wait to deceive. Therefore, as much as we listen to what others will say, someone may come with a very good proposal and tell you this is a sure deal. I guarantee you, you are going to make money. You are going to prosper. Take time. Get the facts right. Commit it to God in prayer and act upon the conviction that you receive from the Holy Spirit. The third lesson that I'd like us to learn is that the sin always has consequences. Sin always has consequences. Yes, we may choose the actions that we take. We may have control over that which we want to do, but we do not have control over the consequences that will come. We may try in our, in our understanding and in our wisdom to manipulate the outcomes of our actions, but we can only do that to a very small degree. King Ahab thought by deceiving or by disguising himself as an ordinary soldier, he would, he would be able to circumvent the prophecy of God. But that was not to be the case. You can, of course, you can choose your sin. You, can choose, you cannot choose the consequences of the actions. Uh, for the most part, as we learned, King Jehoshaphat was a God-fearing God. However, because he allowed himself to make connections that were contrary to the will of God, we can see the kind of consequences that came upon his life. The first was that he lost that battle to the Assyrians. If you read the story of King Jehoshaphat, just to get a bit of context. In First Kings, we are told of how King Jehoshaphat had really prospered. He was mighty. He had built cities and fortified them. He had established an army to the point whereby all his neighbors were afraid of him. Probably that's the reason why Ahab thought, if I join this, if I sell this idea to Jehoshaphat and he 
buys into it, chances of us winning this battle would, be, would, would almost be guaranteed. But despite all that, he still ended up losing that battle. As it's clearly written in Second Chronicles chapter 18 or chapter 19, verse 1, which says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. We are not told about any victories. So much money again was lost. He lost a lot of fortune when he built ships that he intended to sail to Tarshish with King Ahaziah, who had pitched that idea to him because those ships were all destroyed. And finally, we see his family crumble. He may have been faithful to God. His history might have been good. By the time he was dying, he may have made, amended, you know, have made amends to his ways, but the consequences still remained. We can see how his family crumbled, and this is actually the, the, the last lesson that we're going to learn this evening. This is your family members, your friends, and those who are around you are listening and watching the kind of decisions we're making. Of course, we are told in Second Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 to 3, that Jehoshaphat gave the kingdom to his eldest son, Jehoram, who was the son-in-law to King Ahab. He had married the daughter called Athaliah. But seeing the kind of decisions that his father made, the, the, and, and of course, it being very tragic that Jehoshaphat would allow his son to take as a wife the, the, the daughter of King Ahab, a king who had done, who was doing evil in the ways of the Lord, already set the precedence. Because we see Jehoram, we are told it's recorded in the Bible that he took after the kings. He followed in the ways of the king of Israel. He followed in the ways of his father-in-law. And because of that, because of uh, the wickedness that he uh, that was in his heart, he ended up killing all his brothers. And we are seeing these are just consequences that came as a result of the choices that King Jehoshaphat did. In many ways, he saw a man who was courageous, that was his father, Jehoram, so he's, he was courageous in the ways of the Lord. In other ways, Jehoram saw a man who allowed ungodly kings to make his decisions. Uh, he walked in the ways of the king of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife. This is Second Chronicles chapter 21, verses 4 to 7. Part of the problem was the inconsistency of the example that his father set. At one point in time, he is faithful to God. At certain instances, he follows in the counsel of those who are wicked. Um, therefore then, what do we learn? Or what do, how do we conclude the message for today? We should be courageous in the way of the Lord. We ought to be careful with whom we have, who we allow to have influence over our lives. The kind of connections we form our intentions, as we said, may be noble, may be good, but if we end up with the wrong individuals, more often than not, we end up falling. As the common uh, saying goes, it is easier for someone who is down to pull you down rather than the one who is up to pull them. The other thing we ought to learn is never to depend upon our own understanding. 
Let us always rely upon God. The main mission that we have in this world, of course, is to spread the word of God to the rest of the world as we anticipate his soon return. And God has said in his word, the most or the sure, the most sure strategy that we can take is if humanity takes hold of divinity. That is the only sure way. That is the only guaranteed connection that we can make to guarantee us success in our endeavors on this earth and in the world to come. Therefore, I implore all of us this evening that may we find it in our hearts to take the lessons that we draw from this experience that we learn in the story of King Jehoshaphat and King Ahab. And may it be an experience for us to learn from and that will help us make the right decisions in this world. And with that, I pray that may God bless you and may he establish himself in your hearts as you contemplate upon the message for tonight. Let us pray. Mighty Father, what in heaven, we want to thank you for the message that you have brought to us this evening. Thank you for the lessons that we have been able to learn from the experience of King Jehoshaphat. Oh Lord, I pray that may these experiences not be mere stories that we read in the Bible because we know these are experiences that have been recorded to help us establish ourselves in the faith as is correctly put in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. For all scripture has been given by you, O God, to train us, to rebuke us, to abhor us, O God, and to guide us in our walk with you. That at the end of it all, O God, we may be established in your word. Father, may we take these lessons to heart. May we always depend upon you and call upon your name the various endeavors we have in this life. And above all, O God, in the ultimate mission, or the ultimate project, if we may term it that way, of bringing souls to your kingdom, of spreading the word to the fires of the earth. May we rely upon your guidance. May we seek upon your strength and not rely upon our understanding or whatever we think we believe we know about your word. May we humble ourselves and allow you to use us this world as we prepare ourselves for your soon return. Be with us now even as we come to the end of this program. Meet us at our points of need, O oh God, and I ask that, Father, may your will be done in our lives. For this is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May we end with the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.